If you recall, this week has been all about the gradient. This is where we take our partial derivatives and our vectors and combine them. This is kind of like acting uh, in a way as our first derivative did back in the day. So remember that the uh, the origin of this derivative stuff, if you think about uh, our time back in Calc 1, was we want to find the slope of the line tangent to a curve at a given point. We want to find the instantaneous rate of change of a function at a given point. Now, all we needed back then was the derivative at a point. Derivative is a local calculation. It happens at a point. It's an instantaneous uh, rate of change. But now we have a function of two variables. We can't just say the rate of change at a point. We have to say the rate of change at a point in a specified direction. We need three things. Because I don't have just change in x, I've got change in y. And so since I've got two directions for change, I've got 360 degrees of direction for change. So we want the derivative. The gradient is like a derivative. I'm going to put it in quotes. At a point, and the new thing in a given direction. I want to specify the thing that you will be given. You have to be given. So that's an old thing, the derivative at a given point. But the new thing, since we have two variables, we have 360 degrees of direction. So we have to specify which direction we're looking at the rate of change. So the gradient is we're looking at a derivative at a given point in a given direction. That's the new part because we have a function of two variables. We don't just have change in x, we've got change in x, we've got change in y. We've got a whole plane of change where we can go. We don't just have change in x. In the old days, we just had the change in x. There's only one way to go, or negative one times that direction. But now we've got two variables. We have to pick which direction we're looking for the change. So we're adding to the derivative at a point. To that end, we built this thing called the gradient. And I told you, I absolutely did not tell you how the directional derivative worked. I made you figure it out yesterday. And the conclusion that it looks like everybody was coming to was that there is some kind of dot product involved, which makes sense. We've got vectors. I want to know how much of one vector is going in a particular direction. And that's dot product. That's what the dot product is for. It's for multiplication, but at an angle. We have the gradient as our maximum direction. We just want to grab some other given direction. I want to see how much of that maximum we're going to get. So the calculation came down to a dot product. We were doing multiplication at an angle. And the question and the gradient is our maximum increase. And we want to know how much of that maximum increase we are getting in any particular direction.
The gradient at a point is giving us the direction and the maximum increase at that point. We want to know how much of this maximum increase are we getting in a specified direction. So we have notation for this, of course. So this is what we want to calculate, the derivative of some function of two variables at a given point in a specified direction. One of the things that we want to be uh, make sure that we have is that uh, the direct, we specify the direction with just direction, nothing that will alter the magnitude. We just want direction. We want a magnitude of one. So a unit vector has magnitude of one. The reason is we're going to be calculating with a dot product, and I want to see what portion of the maximum we are getting. We don't want the if we don't use a unit vector, then we're going to be getting more than just direction from the unit vector. Our notation for this is f with respect uh, in the direction of v at a b. It's the gradients of F at AB dot the unit vector B. It is the dot product. We're trying to see what percentage of this maximum increase, maximum rate of change are we getting? That's why we need to use a unit vector. If the unit ve if instead of a unit vector, we have a vector with magnitude two, we're doubling things and then pulling in direction. That's just going to throw things off. So since this is the dot product, this will be the magnitude of the gradient at that point times the magnitude of the unit vector V, which is going to be one. times the cosine of theta. So the cosine of the angle between the gradients and the direction we're interested in is going to give us the fraction of the maximum increase that we get. The interesting points that we came up with uh, yesterday, the directions that we cared about yesterday, cosine of zero, that's where the, the in the same direction as the gradient, we're getting all gradients. So cosine of zero is equal to one. Cosine of 90 degrees is equal to zero. 
if we are moving perpendicular to the gradient, then the function is not changing because perpendicular to the gradient, we are moving in the same direction as the level curve. And if theta is 180 degrees, we have the opposite. So yesterday we had a maximum of four. If we moved in the opposite direction, our rate of change is negative four. If we move perpendicular, our rate of change was zero because we're moving along a level curve. The level curve is defined by the lack of change in the function. If we're moving tangents to the level curve, if we're moving along the level curve, we're moving tangent to the level curve, then the value of the function is not changing. That's the whole point of the level curve. We're going in the same direction as the gradient. We're getting all of that maximum increase. If we're moving perpendicular to the gradient, then we're getting zero of that maximum increase. If we're moving in the opposite direction, then we're getting negative one times that maximum increase. The portion, the proportion, the portion that we're getting will vary with uh, like a cosine. So if we have a gradient, if we're moving perpendicular, that's going to be zero. Zero, uh, function is not changing. The directional derivative is going to be equal to the magnitude of the gradient. at zero degrees. We go backwards. The rate of change of the function opposite the gradient will be just negative one times the gradient at 180 degrees. And we're going to be varying by the cosine. So we're going to be varying by the cosine. So that means if our if the direction specified is at 45 degrees, I didn't plan that out very well. I need to stop this down. Our directional derivative at 45 degrees is going to be um, 0. 0.7071 times the gradient of f. Because the cosine of 45 is root 2 over 2, which is 0. 0.7071 approximately. So if we're at 45 degrees, we get about 70% of the gradient. 
questions? How's everybody okay? If we're at 120 degrees, what's the cosine of 120? Fair. Negative a half. Cosine is negative in the second quadrant, and we have a 60 degree reference angle. Cosine of 60 is a half. How's everybody okay? It's always sketchy when we get into trig in your calculus classes. Because not everybody shows up in calculus with kind of like a full treatment of trig. I walked into calculus um, having had pretty much three weeks of trig. So in my high school, they crammed trig at the end of algebra two. So they're like, well, algebra two slash trig. I'm like, ah, we're going to be spending some time on trigonometry in this algebra two class I see, which would have been intermediate algebra. We did one, algebra uh, algebra one was elementary, algebra two was intermediate. I know some schools, elementary is algebra one and two and intermediate is algebra three and four because, I mean, having a common numbering system would just, that would be ridiculous. But anyway, I'm like, ah, algebra two, and trig at the same time. And the semester kept going on till the end of the year, getting close to the end of the year. So I go, um, are we going to do any trig? And then finally, like three weeks to go, they're like all trigonometry. My all dude is there's three weeks in the semester. I do not care about this anymore. Don't you understand how students work? Whatever happens in the last three weeks right. didn't happen. And then, of course, the teacher philosophy at the time was whatever happened in the first uh, 14 weeks, that's the part that doesn't matter. Any questions? So this is a, just a dot product. Uh, it's a dot product calculation. We are not surprised by this. Because the dot product is for multiplication at an angle. The gradient is telling us the direction to go for the maximum increase and what the maximum increase is. If we find the dot product of the gradient and some unit vector, that will tell us how much of the gradient is going in the direction of the unit vector. That's the question for a directional derivative. How much of the gradient is going in the direction of a unit vector? How much of the gradient? How much of the gradient is in the, uh, I was writing secret stuff. How much of the gradient is in the direction of the unit vector? How much of the gradient is in the direction of the unit vector? That tells you we're gonna do the gradient dot the unit vector because that's what the dot product is for. Any questions? That's the most important part that this question, how much of the gradient is going in the direction of a unit vector? That should make you think of dot product. That should make you think of the dot product. We're trying to build a kind of a new instinct around multiplication. That's why I keep referring to the dot product as multiplication at an angle. It's the product of the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between the vectors. Is everybody okay? Yeah. 
the reason that I care about this is that the the we we kind of we spend a lot of time where we get away with just multiplication when we're multiplying real numbers. Here's how fast you were going. Here's how long you were going. How far did you go? Here's how far you went. Here's how much time it took. How fast were you going? It's all multiplication and division, but everything's kind of going in the same direction. Now we have to think about multiplication at an angle. The reason that we need to do this is that our multiplication was super useful when we start interpreting integration as multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. Integration is multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. That's the first problem that we solve in calculus. I want to do multiplication. Distance is equal to rate times time. But our rate is continuously variable, so what do we do? We integrate. Area is equal to length times width, but the length is continuously variable. So what do we do? We integrate. That's what calculus does. Work is equal to force times distance, but the force is continuously variable over the distance. So what do we do? We integrate. So then when the question comes up, what are applications of integration? All we have to think of are applications of multiplication, where we make one of the factors continuously variable. Now we've got new multiplication. Dot product is multiplication at an angle. So when we think about what are the applications of this vector integration that we're doing, all we have to think of what our app, I know, I know we haven't done any actual integration with dot product yet, but this is where things are going. What are the applications of this integration with a dot product? It's just the applications of the dot product. It's just when we're going to be multiplying at an angle. So we'll find out that work was not force times distance. Work is force dot distance because the force can be at an angle to the distance that we're going, the direction of travel. Does that make sense? This is building things kind of ground up rather than here's a problem, let's just solve this kind of in isolation. Then we just get distracted with all the details because trig substitution is so much fun. That's right, I said, fun. My favorite quote from Bull Durham, fun, goddammit. Any questions, comments? Yeah, can I remark? Trigonometry is super fun. Not just fun, super fun. So uh, this is why yesterday we had uh, our function was four minus x squared minus y squared at the point negative root three, one. I used 150 degrees, right? On a circle of radius two. Our gradients as a function is minus two x i minus two y j. Our gradients at the point negative root three, one was negative two root three i, positive two root three i minus two j. If we went, when we went in the direction opposite this vector. So in part D, the given vector was the opposite of this. So negative two root three and positive two. 
Now we don't want the dot product of the gradient and this vector because this vector is not a unit vector. So uh, four times three is 12 and four is 16 square root is four. So if we take a vector and divide it by its magnitude, that'll be a unit vector in the same direction is what we need in this case. There's a unit vector in the direction of V. The notation that we have now would be the FV, the derivative of F in the direction of V at the point, negative root three, one, and that will be the dot product of the gradient. And a unit vector in the direction of V. So here we get two root three times root three over two, which is just gonna be the square root of nine, three, uh, negative three, and then two times minus two times a half, which is one. So minus three minus one is minus four. Just as we suspected, because negative two root three is the opposite direction of the gradient. And that's a negative four. The magnitude of the gradient was four. And here we get negative four because we were going in the opposite direction. Here I gave you a vector that was perpendicular to the gradient. This is not a unit vector, so we need to find the magnitude of W. It's not going to matter because we know that this is perpendicular, but we'll take W and divide by the magnitude of W. There's a unit vector in the direction of W. We're pretending that we don't know that this is gonna come out to be zero. And so the magnitude isn't gonna matter because the cosine of theta is gonna drop a zero on our calculation. But the directional derivative, the derivative of F in the direction of unit vector W in the direction of W at the point negative root three, one will be the gradient of F at negative root three, one to root three, negative two dot the unit vector in that direction. And we got zero here because uh, W is perpendicular to the gradient. That means W was the direction of the level curve, the level curve where the value of the function is not changing.
perpendicular to radians. Tangent to the level curve, the function is not changing. The unit ve the vector u three fifths four fifths is already a unit vector. U is already a unit vector. That's bad grammar. You are already a unit vector. So we can just run the U through the calculation. Well, this is unfortunate. Oh, well. We got six root three over five minus eight over five. So six root three minus eight over five. Point four seven eight two. So out of the four, we're only getting the point four seven eight. It's about one tenth. So look, maybe we're getting close to ninety degrees, but we haven't gone past ninety degrees. So three three fifths, four fifths. It still uh, forms an acute angle with the gradient. And that's what we saw yet. Any questions? Comments? Snide remarks. How's everybody okay? We look so sad. You look like this. You have a four day weekend coming up, and that's the look. Oh, they're still tomorrow. They should always be four day weekend. You probably can't get that. Well, we're going to start with four day weeks, three day weekends forever. Wait, so, so we first have to do the um, by a vector by a If the vector, if the direction that you're interested in, if you want the directional derivative, and you're given a direction, you have to check the magnitude of that vector because when you do the dot product, you want to make sure you're getting some fraction of the maximum. You should only be getting some fraction of the maximum. If the magnitude of the vector, that the, the direction vector is two, you're going to be getting some fraction of two times your gradient, two times the magnitude of the gradient. We saw that yesterday. If we just calculate the dot product of uh, v and the gradient, we end up with ne uh, with a negative sixteen because we have multiplied the gradient by four, the magnitude of v, and then multiplied by the cosine of the angle. 
This is why we want to drop our direction vector to just direction by dividing out that magnitude. Notice that when we got that dot product and it was negative 16, if we divide out the magnitude of the vector V, we get to the negative four that we wanted. How's everybody okay? Direction and magnitude. In the dot product, we just want the direction from our vector. We need to make it a unit vector. If it's not a unit vector, we need to divide by its length to get a unit vector. If it is a unit vector already, then we don't have to worry about it. But we do have to check that it is a unit vector. I'm sorry, are you okay? Did anybody not know that this is a four day weekend coming up? Oh, pleasant surprise. Uh, your students, you have a, 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 like an instinct. You can smell it. There's like a change in the air this week. Like when you showed up on Monday, it's like, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a four day weekend coming up. And they're like, well, how can you tell? Depression is a little bit suppressed right now. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for today. That's uh, tomorrow. We'll talk about gradients in space. Everybody have a good day. And thanks for playing. Bye, Center.